Welcome to the Joseph Carlson Show. Thank you for joining. Obviously, a lot of news items to get to. We have things like the Senate passing an additional bill of $484 billion more for small businesses. This is in addition to the $377 billion that small businesses have already received. So the government's still handing out a lot of money. That's going on right now. At the same time, the Fed is still buying a lot of assets. Their balance sheet has gone up quite a bit. We have news like the collapse of oil. The prices keep dropping. In fact, it was entering into negative territory for a while with some of the contracts where they're quite literally paying you to take oil. So that shows the amount of surplus we have right now, the lack of demand in oil. And then we have the main topic that I really want to focus on later in this video, stock buybacks. It's a very simple thing. I'll explain later in the video what stock buybacks are, but essentially it's just a company buying back its own stock. It seems very simple, but there's a lot of drama, a lot of controversy surrounding it. I'm actually not a huge fan of stock buybacks for the majority of companies. So I'm going to be going through and showing a lot of the criticisms that stock buybacks have, reasons why people have genuine concerns about them, and why I think in most cases they're actually hurting companies. So we'll be taking a look at that. Now, of course, before jumping into those news items, I want to take a look at my portfolio, give a quick update. It's at $80,000 in value. It's been bouncing around a couple thousand here and there. It was up a little bit today on the week, it's down a little bit. So I'm still down 4,800 bucks overall. Now, a lot of people look at this and they view me as winning. If this enters into the green, I'm losing and losing money if it enters into the red. I'm buying companies, that's what I'm doing. I'm buying companies. I showed a lot of different clips from Peter Lynch. I'll show one more clip that really plainly says what I'm doing with my portfolio. Well, I think anybody that's investing in the stock market, that's what I'm saying. You buy a company. These are not lottery tickets. He's behind every stock, there's a company. If the company does well, over time, the stocks do well, and vice versa. You have to look at the company. That's what you're researching. That's what we do at Valley. That's what I do. This is pretty simple, straightforward advice, especially from one of the most well-accomplished, one of the best investors to ever live. Peter Lynch is one of the greatest, and he repeats this message all the time, that you own companies. That's what you're buying. They're not ticker symbols. You'll hear Warren Buffett say the same thing, that you're buying ownership in companies. So you should pay attention to what you're actually buying. Now, of course, I try to view my portfolio the same way. We can look at the numbers here. We can look at the ticker symbols. But this is just a collection of companies I'm buying. They're all in different sectors. They all have different risk profiles. But what I'm buying is a lot of different companies. They all have something in common. They're trying to reward their shareholders through dividends, through payments to their shareholders. So that's what each of these companies are trying to do. We've had some really struggle over the past month. Real estate has struggled. Finance has struggled. We have one more company that has suspended its dividend, Estee Lauder. It's a smaller holding in my company, but the management really just said, look, we sell makeup. Our stores are closed right now that we usually sell them through, like malls and Ulta Beauty. These type of things are closed, so we're going to hang on to our dividend until these things open back up. I think it's totally reasonable. I don't plan on selling Estee Lauder, and I think they'll continue to pay their dividend once things open back up. So I look at my portfolio the same way. I have this collection of companies. I'm in it for the long term. I think most of them are in good shape. I don't know what direction the market's going to go in the next month. There's a lot of people predicting the dip number two, the big downturn, that the economy is in shambles and the market has to follow it at some point. So maybe that will happen. Maybe over the next two months, we'll see this get shaved down to $60,000. I don't know. What I do know is the companies that I own. I think that they'll do well over the next 10 years. I look at this graph and a lot of people might, when they first see this, think it's like some kind of gimmick or something. It's not. It's the primary goal of my portfolio is to create a reliable stream of passive income. So I look at the amount of money I'm earning every single month in dividend income. I can compare it to my parents owning apartments. When I grew up, my parents owned about seven different rental properties. They were rental income investors. And my dad primarily looked at the amount of money he was making in rent. He didn't focus every single day on what Zillow told him that his rental properties were worth. He didn't look at the property value every single day. That really wasn't his concern. It wasn't his focus. So when I say I don't really pay attention to this, it's just a mentality. I look in the past month and see how much money I'm earning in dividends. That's something I see as a lot more of an exciting thing. I see the income stream that I'm building over time. Just like if you own a lot of rental properties, you probably don't focus on the property value every single day. It's the same thing with the dividend portfolio. I'm not focused as much on the total value as the income stream that I'm building. So that's the goal overall. I'm trying to build an income stream. Over the past 30 days, I've earned $291 in dividends. 
That's a lot of money earned with passive income. I didn't have to clock in for that $291. And this is new dividends that I've earned. This isn't paid. This is new dividends over the past 30 days. If I go to my activity feed and filter by dividends, I can see the actual dividends being paid. I get them every couple of days. It's just page after page of dividends being paid. And some of these are pretty decent. $30, $10, $20, $8. Some of these dividends are pretty good. It adds up, gets in my cash balance, gets reinvested. If the market goes down and we have that big dip number two that everybody's expecting, then I'll continue with the plan. I'll continue to dollar cost average. And if my personal financial situation allows, I'll invest more aggressively. So that's the plan. That's always been the plan. It doesn't change despite the market conditions. I'm gonna continue to dollar cost average. If the market does drop down, I'll try to invest more aggressively. And if we do get another really big drop, the one that people are expecting, where we have another 20 or 30% drop, I still have $10,000 worth of bonds. So I'll be selling out of these bonds and moving into equities if we have that second drop. So I'm holding on to these bonds for now. The market's still going back and forth. It's up some days, down others. But if we do have another severe drop, I'll go ahead and sell out of those bonds and buy more equities. Now let's go ahead and move on. I wanna jump into some news and I wanna primarily focus on stock buybacks. Before we jump too far into this, let's get a simple definition of what a stock buyback actually is. Stock buyback refers to publicly traded companies buying back their shares from shareholders. This reduces the amount of outstanding shares in the market and typically, based on simple market dynamics, raises the stock price. That's it. That's all a stock buyback is. It's when a publicly traded company buys back stock of its own company. So the shareholders own the stock, their shares outstanding, and the company decides to buy back its own stock. That's really it. It's very simple on a, on a basic mechanical level. Companies can sell shares of their own company. They do that when they IPO, initial public offering. They're selling a portion of their company. All a stock buyback is is the complete opposite. It's just a company buying back some of the shares of its own company. On a basic mechanical level of what actually a stock buyback is, it seems like a very simple thing. People would wonder, why would you wanna restrict something like this? What is the issue with the stock buyback? It sounds very straightforward. A company believes that its stock is undervalued, so it buys some of its own stock. Simple as that. The problems start to come in when you see really how complex the implications are of a stock buyback. This simple mechanic, of a company buying back its own stock has a whole host of issues that arise from it. One of the main issues is executive compensation. In corporate America, executives make money in a couple different ways. One of them is through their salary. So they usually have a, a typically pretty good salary. They make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but that's not where they make most of their money. Where they make millions of dollars is through stock options. That's the way they make the lion's share of their income. Now, the issue is for executives, they have certain requirements to be met for them to unlock their stock options. Many of those requirements are things like earnings per share. If the company hits a certain earnings per share, the executives get millions of dollars for accomplishing that feat. Now, what is one of the easiest ways to increase the earnings per share of a company? Wouldn't you know, it's stock buybacks. In this Reuters investigative report, this was back in 2015, it talks specifically about this issue. When health insurer Humana reported worse than expected quarterly earnings in late 2014, including a 21% drop in net income, that's a pretty bad drop, it softened the blow by immediately telling investors that it would make $500 million share repurchases. So that's $500 million of stock buybacks, in addition to soothing shareholders, the surprise buybacks benefited the company's senior executives. It added around two cents to the company's annual earnings per share, allowing Humana to surpass its $7.50 earning per share target by a single cent and unlocking higher pay for the top managers under terms of the company's compensation agreement. So let me break this down for a minute here. You have a company, Humana, that has declining earnings. It earned 21% less net income than it was before, which is a 21% drop in the amount of money that it's profiting. That's not a good thing for a company. That is a terrible thing to have your earnings go down. So that's a big negative. What they did is the executives said, well, our company's earnings is going downwards. Let's go ahead and buy some of our shares, stock buybacks. That artificially increased the earnings per share of the company, which unlocked executive compensation for them. And then here's the kicker. Thanks to Humana hitting that target, Chief Executive Officer Bruce Broussard earned a $1.68 million bonus for 2014. 
So let's just get this straight for a minute. The executive here, Bruce, he was awarded $1.68 million in compensation for the achievement, for the accomplishment of having his company earn 21% less money. That's the relationship here. You might be saying in your head, Joseph, that sounds really crazy. Why is an executive getting awarded millions of dollars when his company is declining in revenue? To you, I say, I agree. That does sound crazy. The issue is these type of metrics that are linked to executive compensation are all things that can be pumped up with stock repurchases. So stock buybacks become almost this cheat code to unlocking massive amounts of bonuses for executives. They don't really need to worry about the long-term view of the company, how much money the company is actually making. They don't really need to worry about what the implications are for the common shareholder. Executives get these bonuses if they meet these certain metrics and an easy way to meet them is through stock buybacks. Now, later in this report, it mentions that this has spawned a little bit of criticism. It says the soaring CEO pay tied to short-term performance measures like earnings per share is promoting criticism that executives are using stock repurchases to enrich themselves at the expense of long-term corporate health, capital investment, and employment. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of that criticism. It's not an accusation, it's a fact. After the Trump tax cuts passed, billions upon billions of dollars have been used uh, for shareholder buybacks in large public companies across the United States. And in the speech that I gave, I showed that those buybacks are accompanied by, at the same time the company buys back shares, the executive sells into the buyback. Now, we were clear in the speech that that's not necessarily insider trading or fraud, but it is troubling. Because when an executive does a buyback, they're suggesting to the market that the stock is cheap. And the question I'm asking is, if the stock is cheap, then why is the executive selling into the buyback? I think that's a very valid question. This is SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson. This isn't a political pundit. He was appointed by President Trump, and he's just pointing out that when a company does stock buybacks, that's an indication from the executives that they think the company's shares are cheap. They're of a good value. So why are the executives selling their personal holdings in the company right as they issue stock buybacks? That seems very contrary to the message they're sending out to investors. The SEC has actually done an entire study on this. I read through it and the data shows exactly what you would think. When these companies decide that their stock is so valuable that they're gonna start buying up their own stock, executives sell right after the announcement. So they're signaling to the market that the stock is cheap and then executives decide to sell out. That doesn't make any sense, but that's what we see here. And part of the study, it's titled, How Executives Use Buybacks to Cash Out. It says in half the buybacks we studied, at least one executive sold shares in the month following the buyback announcement. In fact, twice as many companies have insider selling in the eight days after a buyback announcement as they sell in an ordinary day. So right after the company tells the market that the stock is cheap, executives overwhelmingly decide to sell. Every day for the next eight days after a buyback announcement, executives sell on average $500,000 worth of stock each day. That's pretty incredible. So we're announcing stock buybacks. Our company has really cheap stock. We want to buy back more of it, but we're personally going to sell out of all of our stock in the company. That's what executives are doing. Now, of course, the SEC is not the only one that's raised concerns about this, that has pointed out that stock buybacks are clearly being abused to reward executives over the common shareholder. There's been some politicians that have pointed out this same issue here. Elizabeth Warren is one of them. Second one, let's change the compensation structure for the CEOs to say that the CEOs will not be permitted to juice the price and then once they juice the price, make a quick right. sale, make a bazillion dollars, and keep emphasizing the incentives. That's what we've got now for short-termism. Want to get rid of it. Elizabeth Warren is saying she wants companies to focus more on the long term. She talks about temporary juicing up the stock. Now, what does she outline as the tool used to juice up the stock? The money is to be made in short-term juicing the stock. Look at the trillion dollars in buybacks that have occurred. That's not investment in these companies. That's nothing more than a sugar high for those companies in the short term. Helps the top executives, but doesn't help the company long term and sure doesn't help the employees and sure doesn't help the communities they're in. So politicians like Elizabeth Warren have been going after stock buybacks for a long time now. Stock buybacks have been really the center of criticism for corporate America for a while in the political sphere. There's politicians like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, Senator Schumer, but it's not only Democrats. There's Republicans like Marco Rubio that have expressed concerns as well. Now, out of everything that's potentially a problem, 
This last one's the biggest. So, so far we have executive compensation. We know that stock buybacks have been used as a tool to pump up certain metrics like earnings per share, unlocking these huge bonus for executives, despite the company's not performing well. So the company can be in a decline, it can have reduced earnings, but if you buy enough of your own stock, it will bump up those metrics. So we have that issue, that criticism there. We have the issue of executives and insiders using stock buyback announcements as an opportunity to cash out of the company, showing that they're not personally in alignment with the decisions they're making with the company. But the third issue, and probably the most damning, is companies that binged on buybacks now seek bailouts from taxpayers. This is the point that really is upsetting. Here's one article from CNN out of the many that point out the problem here. Some of the companies that binged on buybacks are in line to receive taxpayer-funded bailouts to keep them alive. Boeing, for example, spent $11.7 billion over the past two years on repurchasing stock before suspending the stock buybacks in April of 2019. The aerospace behemoth is now requesting $60 billion in federal assistance as the coronavirus crisis has crushed its customers and forced factories to shut down. Southwest Airlines spent $2 billion on share buybacks in 2019. Similarly, last year, American Airlines also spent $1.1 billion to purchase its stock at an average cost of $32 per share. American Airlines closed Monday at just $10. So they purchase stock of their own company at three times the price it's currently trading at. Now the airline industry is seeking $50 billion in federal help as it fights for survival during the stunning decline in worldwide travel. It also points out in this article that it's not just the airline industry that has had this issue. Hilton announced $2 billion worth of buybacks. Days later, Hilton withdrew its earnings outlook. The hotel industry is now seeking some $150 billion in federal assistance as the coronavirus has caused occupancy rates to drop. This is the point that people are really upset about, that these companies have spent every dime they've earned for the past 10 years buying their own stock, and then when we run into trouble, whether it's the coronavirus or anything, when we run into trouble, now they come to the taxpayer for a bailout. This is something that is extremely upsetting, reasonably so to most people that are paying taxes. This is also most certainly, in my opinion, going to spur more political movements to restrict buybacks. It says, this situation is only deepening the backlash against buybacks, paving the way for bipartisan restrictions against share repurchases by bailed out companies. So I think this is going to turn into a bigger issue. As people learn more about buybacks and the ways that they're being abused, I think more people are going to be upset by them. Now, we've already gone through a list of reasons that people could be concerned about buybacks. People could be reasonably upset about them. But just to add insult to injury, let's look at when companies actually do buybacks. The blue bars here, that's when a company is doing a buyback. That's the amount. So the vertical blue bars is the amount the companies are buying back. And then the green line is the S&P 500. So notice the connection there. Companies are buying back stock at the worst possible time. They don't buy more of their stock when their stock drops in price. They buy more of it when it's very expensive. That's when companies have been buying back stock, when it's really expensive. So it's difficult to argue that buybacks are really helping these companies. Now, my biggest concern with everything that we've said about buybacks, all the issues that are specific to buybacks, is that people will naturally want to lump in dividends with buybacks. Because those are the two very direct way that you can return capital to shareholders. You can do stock buybacks, which pump up the price of the stock, or you can issue dividends. And a lot of people, when they're criticizing buybacks, they like to throw in dividends as well. The issue is, is that dividends do not have the same type of potential of abuse that buybacks have. So I think it's very unfair to lump dividends in with buybacks. Here's an article from the Wall Street Journal that notes the differences between the two. It says the real problem is that buybacks unlike dividends, can be used to systematically transfer value from shareholders to executives. Research has shown that executives opportunistically use repurchases to shrink the share count and thereby trigger earnings per share based bonuses. You cannot do that with dividends. You can't shrink the share count and pump up the stock price with dividends. So people that try to lump these issues together, it's wrong. Dividends do not have the same potential for abuse that buybacks have. It mentions that executives also use buybacks to create temporary additional demand for shares, nudging up the short-term stock price as executives unload equity. So there you go. Buybacks are different than dividends. People that try to lump these two together, like they're interchangeable, and the only difference is the tax treatment on them. That's what they'll tell you. Buybacks have better tax treatment than dividends. They're wrong. Buybacks have extraordinary potential for abuse that does not exist with dividends. Dividends do not have the same potential for abuse that buybacks have. So they're completely different. 
I would be much happier if more companies stopped doing buybacks and instead issued dividends. And they do it in a responsible way where they keep a good balance sheet and have a low payout ratio. That's what I would hope. But don't let people tell you that buybacks are the same as dividends. If they believe that, they probably haven't looked at the facts. Okay, moving on, let's jump into some emails. We got some good ones. Joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com if you'd like to send me questions, comments, criticisms, all that good stuff. The first one, hello, Joseph. My name is Chelsea, and I have been watching your show for months now. Your videos are great quality, and since I am almost the same age as you, I find watching your portfolio progression very inspiring. I was browsing Reddit, and I came across a thread that reminded me why channels like yours are so valuable for steering young people away from making truly heartbreaking financial mistakes. This person lost six figures of cash, money that could have set him up for success for the rest of his life, betting on options. He makes an average Canadian salary for his age, has significant debt, and his wife is pregnant. Stories like this are why I recommend channels like yours for young people who are looking to get into investing. Every time I go on YouTube or log into Reddit, I see ads promoting day trading and say how I made $100,000 a week next to a person with a huge beaming smile, thrilled that they discovered a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's just gambling. Thank you for using your platform to speak out against these risky investment strategies. Have a great week. P.S. Have you sold everything during the market downturn yet? We both know it's only a matter of time. Well, I appreciate the email, Chelsea. I'll go ahead and put a picture of the Reddit post that you linked to on the screen so people can see that if they're interested. It's pretty much exactly as you described. It's a young kid, 28 years old, makes $45,000 a year, and he lost over $100,000, which was mostly his savings and his inheritance. So this is an incredibly sad thing to see. I do not like seeing people lose these huge amounts of money. I put myself in their situation and thinking about seeing that much money vanish because you made one bad decision would be extremely difficult. So that's a a huge thing that I think would be really difficult, knowing that you could work for two or three years just to earn back the money you lost because of one bad decision. That's something that he's going to have to live with. Uh, There are things that are more important. You have your health, you know, money doesn't mean much if you don't have your health. So there's things that are more important, family and health and that type of thing. But Money is very important, and losing that much all at once would be incredibly difficult. One of my most popular videos, in fact, I think it's the number one upload on my channel, was episode five, which is titled something like, Why New Investors Lose Money. And the beginning of the video has a whole montage of investors just like this losing tremendous amounts of money with single bets. They don't know the risks, they go in with options, and they lose a tremendous amount of money. It is really difficult to watch that happen. I do not like seeing people lose tremendous amounts of money. I put myself in their situation, and that would be something that would be so difficult to go through. Like I mentioned, there'd be other things that are more difficult, health issues and such, but finances are an important thing. It can buy you a lot of peace, a lot of comfort. It's important. Finances does improve your life. If you really allow it, it's a tool that does dramatically improve your life. You should not gamble it away with stupid options. Leave that to hedge funds and people that are doing it as part of a holistic strategy. They're using it to hedge against something. They know what they're doing with it. I don't think new investors have any business messing with these tools. I think that really can't end well in most scenarios. Investors going in and messing with options, that's their introduction to the stock market. I don't see that as a way to build wealth. If you look at the way that people are wealthy, just observe how wealth is built. It's visible. You can see it around you. There's wealthy people, and then there's people that aren't wealthy. Wealthy people have something in common, and it's ownership. They have equity in what they're doing. They own real estate. That makes people wealthy. My parents owned real estate over time. They bought more and more properties. That generated wealth during their lifetime. There's people that own equity in companies. Again, ownership is what makes you wealthy. When you're buying companies, you're buying ownership of them. Just owning them is what builds wealth. Ownership in different practices that you start. If you're a doctor, you don't really become wealthy just from your salary. You can have a high income, but the doctors that do really well, the dentists that do really well are the ones that own their own practice and they hire people underneath them to work. They have equity, ownership in a business. A lot of them have ownership in the real estate that they work in. Again, it's equity and ownership. That's the way that people become wealthy. You can say the same thing about law firms. Just their salary is a good income, but that doesn't produce tremendous amounts of wealth. The way that wealth is built is through ownership. Whether you're starting your own startup company, whether you're starting your own brand, whether you're buying stocks or buying real estate, the ownership is what makes people wealthy. Go to Vegas if you want to see how wealthy gambling makes people. 
That's a good indicator. Go when there's, you know, when the casinos are open, but go look at all those people gambling. Do you see a tremendous amount of wealth generated there? The only people getting wealthy there are the owners of the casinos. So I look and observe around me the way that people generate wealth, the way that people build real wealth. It's not through doing options like this. It's not through doing bets. It's through owning equity. Milo says, Dear Joseph, as a regular viewer of your channel from Europe, thank you for asking directly on our behalf when M1 Finance will be available in Europe. Many years away was not the answer I was hoping to hear. That's right. If you guys missed it, I interviewed the CEO of M1 Finance in the previous episode. And one of the questions I knew that I was going to ask is, when is M1 Finance going to be available to Canadians and Europeans and people outside of the U.S.? Unfortunately, the answer he gave was at least many years away. He has good reason for it. It's difficult because every country in Europe has your different regulations and your different laws and red tape. Same thing with Canada and the system set up for the U.S. And then the U.S. has extra regulations for money coming in overseas and it creates a huge burden. So I think with a company like M1 Finance, they're just focused on the U.S. market right now. I think they'll start to move to Europe when the U.S. market becomes more saturated. But even in the U.S., the majority of people are not really investing. Only a percentage of people do. So I think right now it's not a huge focus, unfortunately. People that are in Europe can still invest, but you have to use a different platform. Evo says, hi, Joseph. Absolutely love the show. I look forward to it every week. With the ongoing pandemic, I wanted to hear your thoughts on O, which is Realty Income Corp., and NNN, which is another REIT that's very similar to Realty Income Corp, but have come down in price significantly in the last few months. Thank you for all the great content. Well, Evo, I'm glad that you enjoyed the show. As far as my thoughts on Realty Income Corp and NNN, I don't know NNN that much. So I can't really comment too much on that one. From what I read, it's very similar to Realty Income Corp though. So with Realty Income Corp, it's come down a lot in price. I'm pretty flat on that holding. I think I'm slightly in the red right now, but it's pretty flat overall. Realty Income Corp is one of the highest quality real estate holdings that you can have. They have roughly 5,000 properties. Their tenants are really well-capitalized tenants that are typically recession-proof. Some of their tenants, though, are the type of businesses that are closed during the pandemic. So you're talking about theaters, gyms and health spas, stuff like that. So those type of things are closed down right now which means that they are probably asking for rent relief. They're probably asking Realty Income Corp saying, hey, we want to defer our rent payments. I don't think that this will result in permanent loss for Realty Income Corp. I think most of these companies will be able to pay rent back when they start to open back up, but it could cause problems in the meantime. And I think it makes up for about 20 to 30% of their current renters. So my thought process on Realty Income Corp is that over the next six months, it could be rough. Their dividend seems to be stable so far, but they could have some trouble with tenants for the short time. I think overall, it's still a very strong holding, and I can't say that for every other type of REIT. There's a lot of other ones that their tenants aren't in nearly as good of a position. So I'm still holding on to Realty Income Corp, and that's a company where if it does drop in value quite a bit, I will be picking up more shares. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode there. I did want to mention one thing before, though. That is, the channel hit 100,000 subscribers a couple days ago, which is an astronomical number. When you really think of 100,000 people subscribing, that is an enormous amount of people. So I appreciate each one of you. I know you might not think it makes much of a difference if you're just one person subscribing, but it does make a difference. It wouldn't happen if each of you didn't subscribe. So I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody that supports the channel, that shares it with friends, all that type of stuff. I wouldn't be able to do this and have fun with this project and making this content if people didn't subscribe. So I'll be talking more about this this weekend. I have another video where it's gonna be a little bit more relaxed. I won't be going this deep into stock buybacks and this type of stuff that I had planned out. So I'll be talking about this subject more, but I just wanted to mention that. I appreciate all of you and I'll be talking with you guys soon.